Today we're talking with Andrew Gregg. And Andrew is a documentary filmmaker, and he's produced a brand new documentary, which will be appearing on the documentary channel uh, this coming Sunday evening. And uh, Andrew is writer, director, and co-producer of a brand new documentary called Sky Master Down. And we welcome Andrew to the show. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Always happy. Yeah, always nice happy to see to you. you again. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. always have some some interesting things to talk about. Your uh, mm -hmm. your your documentary career has been long and uh, storied, uh, and you've got a, this brand new one, uh, particularly fascinating because it, the story starts back in 19, 1950, was it? 1950. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could set the scene for us. What was happening? 1950, the story takes place uh, in the Yukon primarily. And 1950, if you were uh, to place yourself in the North at that time, excuse me, <coughs> it's only seven years um, after the Alaska Highway sort of was rapidly pushed through the wilderness after the Japanese attacked Alaska, uh, the Aleutians. So, um, you know, they pushed the Alaska Highway right up through, through British Columbia into the Yukon and all the way up into Alaska so they could fortify military bases up there and, and move thousands and thousands and thousands of people, plus all the equipment that they'd need. At the same time, they also created a highway through the sky that mirrored the highway on the ground called the Northwest Staging Route. And that was the, that was the flight path for all the flights going back and forth between the lower 48 states and Alaska, right over the Yukon again. So in 1950, the job of the military had switched from uh, the, the Second World War, which was to defend uh, North America in the North from the Japanese, it was now to defend North America from the Soviet Union. And as, as they ramped up to the Cold War. Also, it was a uh, relay point for everybody going to Korea. If you were going to fly to Korea, you'd fly up through Elmendorf Air Force Base at Anchorage and then head over to the... So there was a lot going on. And there were planes flying back and forth all the time. This particular plane, we call the film Skymaster Down because it was a Douglas C-54 Skymaster. Uh, the domestic version was a DC-4. People probably heard of a DC-4. And um, it was flying from Anchorage, Elmendorf Airport ba Air Force Base in Anchorage, down to Great Falls, Montana, and then everybody on board would disperse and go on leave. So there was 44 people on board in total, crew and passengers. Everybody was a military man except for a woman. Her name was uh, Joyce Espy, and she was pregnant and tra traveling with her two-year-old down to see an obstetrician in, in Colorado. Um, they... Back then, the radar was in its infancy. So they would check in with radio outposts along the ground every 100 miles. So every half hour, you got to check in and say, yep, well, altitude's good, airspeed's good, no problems. They checked in at several of these places and then flew from Alaska into the Yukon airspace, checked in at the first radio outpost inside Canada, inside Alaska, a little place called Snag. And then after that, no one ever heard from them again. Wow. And not a single rivet, to our knowledge, has ever been found. So there's a, there was about a, a hundred mile distance between when they were heard and when they should next have been heard. Yes. That would seem to be a pretty good search area. What was, was the search comprehensive back in the day? What happened was there was there was a there was a couple of things going on. Um, the the search was the largest ever by the U.S. military in North American history, um, and uh, the at the same time there were these war games, winter war games, being planned for the Yukon between the United States and Canada. So there were thousands of people coming in again with all sorts of stuff for these winter war games. There was a lot of confusion and a lot going on. Uh, they mounted the search with the planes they had, which all tended to be pretty big, like a DC-3. And, you know, they've got portholes like this that are that are fogged up in the, in the wintertime. They've got lower wings, so you've got no visibility on the ground. So the solution to the search was to send as many planes and people out, but without a real plan. Um, and because these war games were starting up, every time there was a flare or a parachute or anything, people phoned it into this central search center and said, I heard something. So then a plane would go off that way. 
or a plane would go off this way. So they they were they threw a lot of uh, uh, a lot of effort and machinery at it, but there really wasn't a wasn't a search plan. And in fact, four search planes crashed while they were looking for this guy master. Uh, nobody was killed in those crashes, but they were pretty dramatic. And in the film, we actually visit two of those crash sites. Um, sorry, go ahead, Mike. I was just going to ask, uh, what what time of year was this, and was the search effort in good weather or was it in uh arctic weather arctic weather this was january 26th oh wow and and uh so some mornings they couldn't get the aircraft to start um most of the american pilots from the south as a matter of fact the flight crew on the sky master was from el paso texas limited experience flying in the north particularly in the winter time um and also that area that they were flying through was fairly mountainous um, those airplanes, because they weren't pressurized and they're, because they were carrying people, they couldn't fly higher than 10,000 feet. And there are mountains along the route that are seven. So it doesn't give you a lot of room for error. Um, and then to the south are some of the biggest mountains in North America in the St. Elias range of the Colony National Park. So if they happened to veer off the flight path, if they thought they could get cheeky and look for a shortcut, it wouldn't be long before they were into in literally over their heads. Obviously, in in the Yukon, the the terrain is extremely varied. There's the mountains, as as you just described them, and and there's lots of barren land and and lots of lakes as well. So, uh, I, I'm assuming that the the search plan was to look in all these different terrains. And uh, did they get any help from the uh, uh, indigenous uh, population? They never asked. Um, and that's, we, we deal with that in the story that, um, um, no, the, the, the plan was just military, military, military. As a matter of fact, they did go in Whitehorse and recruit like volunteer firemen and threw them on airplanes to be search searchers out the windows, but they never thought to ask the first nations people who know that land. And, and, and sure enough, you know, in the years later, there were people that remembered noises, uh, remembered seeing things. As a matter of fact, um, not long uh, after the search sort of wound down, a trapper named Albert Isaac, who lived out in southwest Yukon near Kluwani Lake, came into town and went into the RCMP office. Um, he'd been in the bush for months and he had no idea that anything had happened. But he went in to say, I heard a loud bang and saw signs of a massive snow slide with uh, scavenger birds hanging around. Um, and the RCMP flew out in a little plane and circled it. But that was it. Like there was no more, no more. Wow. Searching for it. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, the, 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 uh, a search on foot in January in the, uh, in the Yukon, if you're a Southerner who's on a military exercise, you're not really going to be ready for that. <laughs> but the first nations trappers and hunters could, you know, that was their backyard. And I, I think looking back, it's all in hindsight, but looking back, that was a big mistake. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, during this entire effort, and as you described it, this mass confusion that was going on must have been pretty frightening for relatives who are waiting for news. Yeah, and, and like we found newspaper clippings from all over the place. It was front page news all over the place. Um, and they were waiting for news, waiting for news. Hope was dwindling, hope was dwindling. But the thing is that 70, well, it's going on 72 years now. 72 years later, those families are still waiting. Wow. Um, the story, I think what blew me away when I found out about it in 2018 was how I thought, why didn't I know about this before? I spent a lot of time in the Yukon and I'm a bit of an aviation history buff. And I thought, how come I never heard about this? It turned out hardly anybody else has heard about it either. The, the sort of the, the, the mass amnesia, the, the forgetting that this ever happened. Um, it's quite incredible. Um, so the memory is staying alive with those families around the United States and in some cases around the world, who've been wondering for a couple of generations now what happened, you know, still looking for closure. And um, this small, dedicated group of searchers in Whitehorse that go searching every summer with meager, uh, meager funds at their disposal. I mean, they can only get like a weekend or two in a summer. So they've, uh, they've taken the whole flight path area, it's coordinated off into grids, and every year they fly a few more grids, assuming they can get up in the weather. So um, yeah, you've, you've got all these families who are still waiting and you've got this little group of people they've never met who are still looking. And I'm, I'm, one of the goals for the film is to try to bring them together in one spot on screen. 
It was a, a particularly difficult time, certainly for all the relatives, but, but Robert Espy, as you talk yes. about in your documentary, yes. that's a, a heartbreaking part of the story. Well, earlier in our conversation, like I mentioned, um, uh, Joyce Espy, who was on the plane. So Robert was her husband. Um, and uh, she, th those two actually met when he was serving in India. Uh, she was from uh, she was from Madras. And uh, so they got married. They moved to the States. He got uh, he, he, he got sent to uh, Anchorage. She went with him. Um, they had uh, Victor, their little two year old. And he, he but the, the Alaskan winter was just too hard on her. So they were worried about the pregnancy. That's why they were sending her south. Mm. And Robert took her right to the plane, um, made sure she was sitting next to his best friend. And, she, and he said to her, if anything happens, hand the baby, Victor, over to Roy and put on a parachute. And she said she would. So when the plane, they got news that the plane had gone down, which was barely hours later. Um, it was only a couple hours into an eight and a half hour flight. Um, he somehow managed to get on the next plane to Whitehorse and then hooked a ride on another plane out to Snag, which, you know, this outpost with a few radio operators is now all of a sudden the center of attention and yeah. planes landing at this little airstrip. And he got there and volunteered to go out and look. Um, they told him to stand down because he was ready to walk out on his own, but he managed to get up in a, in a search plane and be a set of eyes out the window. Um, clearly, no luck, uh, but he never stopped searching until he died in uh, the late 1960s. It, it, it haunted him to the end of his days. How sad. And, yeah. and the search group that's still working on it in, in the summers, they're using a much more organized approach to this search. Yeah, in the years since, search and rescue has become much more finely tuned, and there are there are systems and grids and and rules about you know one of the most interesting rules you know they're flying around with people just watching the ground right a spotter. Um, if you're a spotter, you're good for about twenty minutes, then you got to rest your eyes because you start convincing yourself you're seeing things. So it's a it's a taxing exercise, but it's it's much more uh, formulated than it used to be. So they're all with the Canadian, uh, or sorry, the Civil Aviation Search and Rescue Association, which is a national national body of civilian pilots who help uh, police and military on searches. And, and they've got a, just a little bit of money every year to spend on training. So they use that training money to go look for the Skymaster. That's always their goal. So and, they, don't get, they don't get any support from either the U.S. government or the Canadian government to do what really is a a mystery that needs to be resolved for the families. Yeah, and a few years ago, the the the, the Canadian military does do these periodic uh, northern exercises, mm. and a few years ago, they did one called Operation Nanook, which was a stent. There, there'd been a story about a somebody found a cockpit uh, near a mountain, and um, so they thought, well, we're doing a training exercise. Let's have a goal, and we'll go look for this this wreckage. Uh, and everybody was hoping it was the Sky Master. By the time they got uh, all of their material up there on board helicopters and out to a mountain and set up their base camp, somebody said to them, you're on the wrong mountain. And, and they said, well, it's too late now. We're already set up. So, you know, it, 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 it's just like no matter what you do, something gets in the way. Well, in, in your documentary, uh, there's some great uh, aerial scenery. Uh, you. Yeah. And, and you come to realize that the Yukon is, is a very a varied place when it comes to the geography. Like there's some yes. uh, gorgeous mountains, gorgeous lakes and forests, and uh, a very foreboding kind of place if, if you are flying. Uh, there's been quite a number of planes that go, have gone down in the Yukon over the years. Yeah, there's a database that they've put together of over 500 known wrecks in the Yukon. Um, and that's a lot, you know, yeah. um, but, uh, most of those that was in the rush to build the Alaska highway. And then later on to fortify for the cold war. So a lot of the planes, uh, crashed during that period. There was also another, uh, I'll make this quick, but another little known, um, uh, period of history in the second world war that had to deal with Canada. Uh, the United States had a secret deal to provide Russia with thousands of warplanes. It was called the Lend-Lease Program, and the plan was to fly them from the United States up to Nome, Alaska, 
where the Russian pilots would come across, pick them up and fly them back eastward and then attack the, 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 the Germans from the east. All those planes had to fly up over Canada and the Yukon. And a lot of them had green pilots that weren't really, you know, it was a lot of those planes. That oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of those planes went down. And then you've got bush planes, you've got all sorts of stuff. But of that database of the over 500 wrecks, there's only four that um, remain unaccounted for. And one of them is the big one, the Skymaster. Mm. Well, your documentary, as well as covering much of the geography and, and some great aerial photography, people will meet some really interesting individuals along the way as well. Some, some very dedicated people. It's a, it's a fascinating look at a, a mystery that uh, still uh, uh, still uh, drags down all these individuals who would like to find a resolution. Yeah, and I think what we wanted to do was, was first of all, help the families find closure. And mm -hmm. the best thing that we realized we could do, um, because we, we did figure out pretty early on, we're not going to find it. Um, it's, it's, it's very stubbornly lost. Um, I think it will be found. Um, but, um, um, what we wanted to do was bring focus back on the story. You know, it was a big deal for a while in 1950 and then it just went away. We just want to bring it back. And, um, and then maybe just maybe somebody saw something at some point that they didn't want to, re they didn't think to report earlier on. Maybe they'll come forward. Who knows? But the main thing is to get this story back out there. And I hope everybody watching really enjoys it because it's it's one of those stories that you don't know where it's going to go from one scene to the next. You really don't know what's going to happen <laughs> next. It's, it's a bizarre narrative. Well, I think there's no doubt that you've opened the door and, and uh, whether it's people who've seen something or uh, governments who start to uh, kind of open their eyes again. Oh, yeah maybe we should do something about this. Uh, I think it's a great program, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Mike. I appreciate it. Skymaster Down is coming up this Sunday. It's on the documentary channel, and you can see it at 9 o'clock. Don't miss it. You'll really enjoy it. <laughs>